Hey guys, Jim here. Just wanted to kind of come out here and sit down and just talk knives a little bit. Nothing, no particular knife to discuss, just a round table of uh, knives that fit within the uh, the topic that I want to talk about. And what it's going to be really is, is about this crazy year, 2022. You know, we're coming out of all the ridiculousness of the past two years and a lot of products that were held up, a lot of lives that were held up, really, when you think about it. And we had kind of a boring time, didn't we? We didn't have a lot of really exciting new products coming out during the uh, the pandemic. We didn't have any shows to go to. We couldn't experience any of the new products that may have come out. Everything was online, man. Everything was living our life in the, in the knife community through Instagram and, and things like that. And if makers were coming out with something new, we just had to snatch it up real fast online. We didn't get exposed to a lot of crazy new things. And while there have been some amazing designs and amazing materials that have come out of nowhere, um, you know, a lot of the stuff, when you get down to it, is relatively similar. No matter how different the design is, you're still dealing with frame locks, you know, they're always going to be popular. Liner locks, they're always going to be popular. Button locks, out the front automatics, things like that. No matter how different the knife maker or designer creates the knife, it's generally based on a relatively few basic templates. And what I've got sitting out here in front of me really represent where the knife industry is going, and where the innovation lies. And I know you're looking at the two up there going, well, those are just frame locks. Well, yes, they are. However, one of the emerging concepts that we've seen so much recently is multiple deployment methods. Knives that are designed to be opened in a variety of different ways, acting as much like a fidget toy as it does a knife. And that's opened up a lot of really, really cool ideas for a lot of different knife styles. And the Nimble really has done an excellent job of representing what a knife designer can do when they're paired up with a good quality OEM, even overseas. These are made by QSP in China allowing somebody to bring out their creativity without actually being a knife maker. And that's something else we're seeing a lot more of lately. You know, there's always been that. There's always been knife designers that have never made knives that simply work with either custom knife makers to do runs or they work with manufacturers to do production knives. That's, that's not a new thing. But we have seen such a burst of this over the past, let's say, three years, four years. Vero Engineering, EMP EDC. Um, God, I'm, I'm blanking on so many of them, but there's a lot. And they've hit with extraordinary popularity because they have the freedom to just think of really cool things without having to figure out how to execute them. That's the factory's job. They can simply hand sketch their design and turn it over to a good factory with good designers, and they'll be able to create something from that. If that designer is particularly talented with computers, they can do a rendering, they can do a CAD rendering even. And that gives the factory even something more to work off of, like the, uh, the Winter Blade Factor. You know how fucking hard it would be to just sketch this out on a piece of paper and then try to verbally describe to the factory how to execute it with all of the magnets, the placement of them, the strength of them, the lock interface, the pivot position, all the things that make this knife as unique and special as it is. He had to have the talent to properly convey everything that he wanted done. And he did a great job. 
That was flawlessly, flawlessly executed. And probably, out of everything sitting here, probably the most innovative knife of the year. I put it number one, number two, three, four, five out of the innovative knives I brought out here. Now, I own all of these knives except for the Brown Knives FSD that is on loan to me from Lefty EDC. And I figured this was the perfect time to do this video while I had this one sitting here as well because I consider that to be quite innovative as well. And there's nothing wrong with having a great liner lock or a great frame lock. There's always going to be a place for the classics. And, you know, this RH Knives right here is, is a great example of taking that basic form, that basic template. This is a liner lock. And creating a unique design, something special, something sleek, something really beautiful. So it's a unique design, unlike other knives, but when you break it down... Well, it's a liner lock flipper. That's what it is. Same thing with my Poe Han Lu, my good old Hamachi number one, the very first one that Poe made. I want to say this was probably seven, eight years ago now. My God, how time flies. At the time, Superconductor was a super rare commodity, and there was everybody wanted to have something in Superconductor. That was the hot thing. Uh, same thing with the Lightning Strike Carbon Fiber. Uh, which doesn't exist anymore. You can't find lightning strike carbon fiber anymore. But when you get down to it, no matter how special this is and how cool it is and how fresh the design was at the time, it's still just a frame lock. It's not a magnetic retention with magnetic lock with a push bar to act as a flipper and zero friction on the blade. This is something that's unlike anything else that's really ever been marketed to the masses. And that's why it's so much fun. The Winter Blade Factor is, I'm just, yeah, it's the most fun knife I own. It's still practical. It's still got some great uses. But honestly, most of the time I reach for this, it's because I want to fidget with it. And I want to play with it. And I want to hear that ting. Because it's cool. Then you get to something like the Riyadh Exo, which is very hard to deploy when you're not trying to bang your blade into a bunch of other expensive knives. We haven't seen a gravity knife marketed for, uh, I mean, honestly, I hadn't seen one for decades. And there may be some out there that I'm just unaware of. But they certainly didn't have any degree of popularity. And people were skeptical about this when it first released. And when they first started seeing the design. And then out of nowhere, it became monstrously popular. It sold out everywhere. Number one, because it's very inexpensive, to be honest with you. And Riot just, yeah, man, they just knocked it out of the park. They made something cool, made something with fairly complex de uh, design and mechanics. And they made screwing around with your knife fun. For those that are like me that do not have the coordination to own a balisong, this gives you the satisfaction of really cool clickety-clackety mechanical metallic sounds, and a little bit of uh, wrist action and, and and everything else while you're deploying and retracting the knife without risking losing fingertips and chunks of your fingers or dropping it and going through your toes. Well, you could probably still drop this if you're a moron. You drop any knife if you're a moron. But listening to that, opening and closing, it's fun. These have been crazy popular, and they're, they're probably going to continue to make these for years, and they're probably going to continue to be popular. Is this a knife that you're really ever going to carry? Eh, probably not. But you're certainly going to sit and fuck around with it because it's fun. 
Then you get to the uh, the cyber tricks here. God, I love this knife. Super cool. Very, very different design. Unlike anything else out there. And the action feels almost hydraulic. Very much like a Rockstead. And that clean design with no exposed hardware anywhere. Really, really rocks. And it's hefty and substantial. And even though there's almost no thought to ergonomics on that handle, it's actually pretty comfortable in the hand. It's another one that's fidget fun, even though it's just a manual opener with, you want to call them thumb discs because that's the placement and shape of them, but they're not discs very clearly. I guess you could still call them thumb studs, but I mean... I don't know. Whatever they are, they work great, but it's a very standard opening and closing knife. It's kind of a bitch to get in and out of the pocket, the way the pocket clip is made. What is going on here? I got oily fingerprints all over this thing. Pocket clip is a little bit too strong. They could loosen that up a little bit. But other than that, it's been a fantastic knife and a shitload of fun. Nice, nice edge on it, too. Then you get to the Brown Knives FSD. And you got this big, long fuller that you can reverse flick, you can thumb flick, you can front flip, you can use the flipper tab. So it gives you that multitude of deployment methods, just like the, uh, the Nimbles up there. But then you have this unique lock. Something that doesn't really exist anywhere else. It, it, it will remind you of a button lock because of the way it operates. And I'll remind you of a smock lock, the way the backside button pushes over what is sort of a liner lock. It's not, it's an inset tab lock, but still. And the action is wicked. It's insane. And much like the Winter Blade Factor, it's got its own unique harmonics. And that's something else we've been seeing lately. The Jaeger M has a unique tone as it flips out, a little bit of a ting to it. This has a unique sound as it opens and closes. And that's due to the uh, severe pocketing on the interior of the titanium frame. The way that it's been made, there's lots of hollow areas just to hold in the lock and everything else. I don't know if I can quite flip it that way, but it has just some unique properties. You know, and then we get to the crazy shit. Now we have knives that break down with very, very little effort. Let's bring this into frame. This one, not toolless, but it's very simple. All I got to do is get something wedged in there. To pop the back spacer, I'm trying to do this without cutting myself. I just got to get leverage on it. There we go. And all you're doing is popping that back spacer up and out. Unhook it. And now, whoop, you just simply open up the knife. Twist it open. Remove these three screws. That gives you access to the pivot. Because you're taking this panel off. Now you can unscrew the pivot. Take this off. And the whole knife comes apart. I mean, that's crazy. And it shows you why this is no exposed hardware. Everything's on the interior. There's an inner frame. The knife can fully function, lock up everything, without these exterior titanium panels on there. And then when you're done, all you do is just lock it back together. Easier said than done when you're on camera. And it can go in either direction. So now I've got that lined up. Drop that back in. And now it's the exact same as it was before I took it apart. 
Now, once you've brought tools into the equation and unscrewed everything, it'll probably take you a good two, three minutes to disassemble the knife, maybe a little bit more, depending on how fast you screw. <laughs> but it's relatively simple for something that looks impossible to take apart. You're looking at this, and if you didn't know the way the backspacer came apart, you'd be like, well... There's no pivot. There's no screws in the body. How the hell do you take this knife apart to do maintenance or to adjust the pivot or anything else? It's a little hidden mystery. And then you get to the one that's just the most crazy innovative. Come on, fall out of there. And that's the Avian Knives Atlas. Come on, unlock. I'm trying not to scratch up my knife here. Let's get all the parts out of the way. And then, boom, just pop it apart. And that's it. Then I can take the blade out, I can take the bearings out, I can clean everything out. Zero tools. And it can be done in seconds. I think the fastest time I've disassembled this knife was 20, 23 or 24 seconds. Dude, that's friggin' insane. That shouldn't even be possible. Yet it is. By the way, those are skiff bearings that come in the knife as it ships from Avian. That's pretty damn cool. That's another, another thing, too. We're, get, we're being given more opportunities to modify our knives. Look how many people have bought skiff bearings and put them into knives that were already damn good and made the knives even better, made the action even smoother. I'm doing all this trying to look through my camera, which is not the easiest way to do it, but whatever. I mean, how insane is this? an incredible knife it's super smooth absolutely flawless detent break blade self aligns when you put it back together so there's no by the way there is no adjustment on the pivot notice there's no screw on the back side it self adjusts and realigns itself when you put the knife back together how many times have you taken apart even a bare bones basic frame lock like a sabenza or a hinderer, and you had to sit there for another 10 minutes adjusting body screws and adjusting the pivot and adjusting all kinds of other shit just to get the blade to align again. Yeah, well, you don't have to do that with this. And I didn't have to use any tools, and it took me mere seconds. Light as a feather at two and a half ounces. So now I got a knife that is is so redonkulously lightweight, yet it's got a crazy hollow grind that'll slice through anything. Super tough knife in every respect. This frame is in every way as solid as any of these other frame locks, yet there's nothing screwed together. It's all held together by tension on these pins and these jigsaw puzzle-like pieces that slide in and out that interlock between other pieces. Oh, but Jim, oh, oh, it's $625. Oh, oh, my bleeding heart. Out of all the knives here, well, okay, that's a custom. That's it. Everything else I've shown you today has been production except for this, which I just used for an example of a frame lock. That's a custom. So that's a custom in the $800 range. This is a semi-custom. What's the difference? Between this and this, about $200. This is a full-on production knife. This is a semi-custom. They cut all the parts in Thailand because that's where one of the founders of the company lives. So he has the parts cut there, CNC and water jet. And that's it. They take the raw parts and they ship them here to the U.S. And Seth Taylor, the custom knife maker that owns GDS Knives, who's a third-generation custom knife maker, he does everything else by hand. They're hand ground. 
They're hand finished. The, the lock is set by hand. The detent is set by hand. All the parts that are oversized are fit by hand, by him, in his shop in Tennessee, Tennessee. So you're buying a, a U.S. made product, uh, predominantly U.S. Uh, everything, and it's done by one guy, everything done by hand. So there's a difference between buying a production knife made on machines, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not dogging that. When you start going, oh, the price, oh, the price, her, her, her. Well, you're paying for the amount of time that that knife maker is dedicating his life to the product that you're going to have in your pocket. They can only make so many. He can only do so much work himself. So, you know, while this made by QSP, they can put out thousands and thousands at a time if they want to. You know, this is probably limited to probably 15, 20 knives in a month at best. And that's if the poor guy, you know, eats and sleeps and shits in his shop. By the way, don't shit in your shop. It makes a mess and it's, it smells terrible. It's an awful thing to do. Seth stops shitting in your shop is, is what I'm trying to say. Take a little bit of time. Have some class. Anyway, um, so you're buying into a portion of somebody's life. You're getting a certain degree of perfection for that. This has a detent unlike anything else that I've ever had in my collection. It feels amazing. This is spectacular. <laughs> little big, little large. I mean, you know, put this up against even the Nimble X here. And holy hell, it's, it's, I mean, it's not a pocket sword, but it's big. It's crazy lightweight. And that's another thing, uh, you know, knife makers are focusing, even knife designers working with production factories, they're focusing on some really, really important things right now, which weight has always been an important consideration. And for a long time, we forgot about that. Look at, look at how long the overbuilt knife segment has been hugely popular, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's... You know, people like to collect different things, and they're into different stuff, and that's cool. You guys have seen me with Dyer Wares and, and Skype Custom Knives and uh, Medfords and, and things of that nature. Uh, DSK Tacticals. I still carry my DSK Tactical relatively often. There's nothing wrong with that. you got to be in the mood for it, though. But even a knife like this, as large as this knife is, it is so, it's ridiculously lightweight. Pretty damn handsome, too, if you ask me. This is one I don't think is ever going to leave my collection. But it carries so easily. And while I don't find it overly burdensome to carry a heavier, a heavier knife, why did I just start stuttering all of a sudden? What the hell was that? I do appreciate the times when I can carry a lighter knife, depending on how I'm dressed, man. When it's 105 degrees here in Dallas, Texas, and, you know, you start adding the humidity in and everything else, and it feels like it's 110 or worse, you're not wearing jeans or something with a heavy-duty pocket that you can carry a big, heavy knife in. You carry, you're, you're, you're wearing shorts, a material that, you know, the pocket's going to sag a little bit if the knife is too heavy. Or the fit is different, and if you're running or you're briskly walking even, you're going to feel this thing flopping around in your pocket when it's got too much weight. And then you throw something like this in your pocket. What was this, two and a half ounces or something? Uh, just about, because I know this is two and a half ounces. And you throw something like one of these two in your pocket, and it's it just disappears. You don't even realize you're carrying it. This weighs a ton compared to those. It doesn't look like it, but you got a lot of parts in here. This, for its size, is ridiculously lightweight. And these two are you know, standard frame locks. They're in the five ounce range, I think. Four and a half, five ounces. So there's been a different, there's been a shift in focus for makers and manufacturers. One, to create something unique. Two, to, care, to create something that's more EDC friendly. Maybe it's in how slim it is. 
or how slicey the blade is, or how lightweight it is. But one thing I appreciate is when you get into this degree, specifically this knife, of innovation, it sparks that excitement that maybe you lost. It's not to say that you don't enjoy collecting knives, you don't enjoy carrying them and flipping them and uh, cutting with them and buying, selling, and trading them. I'm not saying that. I've never lost my excitement for collecting knives at all. But at some point, you're just kind of dealing with the same stuff. And when something like this comes out and you get it in your hand, maybe you don't quite get that feeling by seeing it on the internet. And I get that. That's fine. But when you put this in your hand and you feel that it doesn't feel like any other knife, for one, and it doesn't operate like any other knife, and it doesn't sound like any other knife. And then you realize just how special it is, and you get excited about it. I remember while I was waiting for this to uh, arrive to me, it took about a week, I was going ape shit. I was really going nuts, and I haven't felt like that for a long time. I do get excited about incoming knives, of course, but I was literally checking the tracking daily. I was aggravated because my mail carrier, because he's an absolute jackass that likes to screw with me all the time, decided to say that, oh, there, there was no access to, to deliver the package when that wasn't true in any way. I was literally sitting home waiting for that package that day, watching it on my tracking app. And I had to go to the post office the next morning when they opened to go pick it up eight miles away. But the excitement that I had as I was waiting for the factor to arrive, I truly don't remember feeling that excited for a couple of years. Doesn't mean I wasn't anxious for this to arrive a few months ago when it did. I was, and I was watching the tracking, and I'm like, yeah, it's out for delivery, man. That's awesome. This is going to be a great day. This one... I almost couldn't function like a normal human being while it was in transit. And I was angry when the mail carrier lied when he signed off on his attempt, attempt to deliver. And unlike, and we've all been there, we've all opened a package that we've been desperately waiting for. And it may not have struck us it may not have hit us with the degree of satisfaction that our anticipation had led us up to. I was cranked for this. And when I opened the box, totally lived up to my expectations. Exceeded my expectations. I liked it more in my hand than I did in pictures, than I did in video. I was like... Hell yeah. This is exactly what I wanted. This is every bit as badass as I wanted it to be. I was excited for this. But when I opened the box, it didn't quite bowl me over the way that I truly expected it to. I mean, I, I expected this level of fevered excitement. I liked it, and I liked the action. I liked how it felt. But I, maybe it's because it won't. Well, I can't say it's because it was so different, because this is 100% different than anything else. I just didn't, I don't know what it was. And it took me until the next day to really get more excited about it. And once I played with it a little bit more, and once I felt it, I really, really appreciated it a lot more. And the next one I have coming, it's, it's not a Cybertrix, uh, but it's a very similar style knife, but in a Persian. I'm waiting for that to arrive. They're making them currently. I just have to wait for the production to be done and for it to be available. And I am super stupid excited about that. And I hope that lives up to my expectation. 
But it took me a day to warm up to this to the point where I'm like, hell yeah, I really, really like this. And I do. Is it a forever keeper in my collection? I can't say that for certain. I really don't know. Right now, I'm excited about it. I'm still kind of in that honeymoon phase. I'm really enjoying it. I really, really like it. But the fact that it's restrictive to certain items in my wardrobe, there are certain pockets this will not clip into. You cannot jam it into that pocket. And you know what? There are some days you're just in the mood to carry a certain thing, right? I'm that way with my handguns as well, my carry gun. I'm in a particular mood to carry that particular gun that day. But I'm also already dressed. I'm not going to turn around and get redressed just to carry something in my pocket or on my hip. I'm just going to adapt to how I'm dressed. And there are some days I've got to put that back in the case and reach for something else here or elsewhere in my collection. So that means this might not be a forever keeper. Will I adapt my lifestyle to it because I like it that much? Maybe. I may just go, hey, because it's like with, with uh, the Atlas and the Factor. Those are two knives that I look at and go, the days that I'm dressed in lightweight shorts, I'm reaching for one of those because they're super crazy lightweight. They work for that. So I might just go, hey, there are the days that I'm wearing particular pants. That's the day I'm going to carry this. And, you know, whatever. So I'm kind of adapting my lifestyle around it. But the fact that there's so much innovation available to us right now and so much more coming. I'm excited because Patrick Famine's going to build me a DOTF, his, his custom out the front. And the new change that he's made in that system will mean that it locks up to the same degree of strength as my deadlock Model C, which you guys know I absolutely adore, which I, if I'm going to talk about it, I should probably bring it out. Best out the front in the world. But you look at it and go, yeah, man, it's blacked out with carbon fiber and a stonewash blade. It's a cool looking EDC knife. But it doesn't scream high-end custom visually. You know, it's not pretty, pretty. And that's okay. I love how this looks. I love the design. But with the famine, it's going to be high-end materials and uh, amazing mirror finishes and, and crazy things going on. And with the new lockup system that he's developed, it's going to lock up like a deadlock. So it's going to give me the best of both worlds. It's going to give me a dressy alternative with the same solidity and uh, hopefully same reliability as, as, the, uh, as the Model C. Now, that's the other thing. I mean, think about how many times you're hanging out in Facebook groups or somewhere online and people are talking about out the fronts and the most common thing you're going to see is a picture of somebody with a blade half retracted and they're like, oh, how do I get the blade back on track? Oh, this isn't reliable. I flipped it too fast, or I did this, or I did that, and it fell off the track, and I, I don't know how to get it back aligned. That doesn't happen with the Hawk. It just doesn't happen. So it has a reliability factor to it that is unlike any other out-the-front blade out there. That's pretty awesome. So it's rock solid, and it's reliable. What more could you ask for? Another very innovative product. It's just not from this year, so it doesn't really fit into this topic of conversation, unfortunately. But this year has been amazing for innovation. It's been amazing for creating knives that give you a zillion different ways to deploy them. They're thinking of Everything. Yeah, I still can't front flip. I just don't like front flipping, so I don't care that I can't do it. I only do it here every now and then to show you guys that a knife has a front flipper. So much fun. And here's the other great thing. As I mentioned before, there are so many people that are going to, you know, these OEMs and having knives manufactured, even custom knife makers. 
Y'all know that right now, one of my absolute favorite knives is my Brian Brown Knives Jaeger M. But it's not his custom. It's the one he had produced by Riot. And the damn knife is so flawless. It's so damn close to a custom. For $400, it's mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. Talked to a few maker friends that came back from Blade Show a few weeks ago, and they're like, man, it's, it's insane that the majority of the show is production knives this year. I was like, really? They're like, yeah. Not only the presence of them, but the popularity of them. They're everywhere, and everybody seems to want one. That's where the industry is going right now especially with inflation and all the other things that are affecting every customer, every person financially. Do you want to spend $1,000 on a knife? You know, here's a good seven, $800 right here. Or if this knife was offered that looked identical and probably operated just as well with materials that are just as nice and it was 400 you'd probably spend the 400 and get the production version. And that's the way it is right now, especially with companies like Riot. Oh, man. The quality level, Reich is up there now too, the quality level is damn near custom. If you handed this knife to somebody, I guarantee they're going to believe that this was a high-end custom Something like this from Gus Sacchini, GTC Knives. This would be a $2,500 knife or more. So you would hand this to somebody and they would go, oh, this has got to be like a $2,000 knife. It's no exposed hardware. It's, it's a beautiful design. It's got these crazy bevels. The action is just absolute sex. You go, no, no, man, that was $399. It's 400 bucks. It's a production knife. It's a very limited production knife, just like these two are. But it's still a production knife. It's being made in a facility on machines by a multitude of people. The maker doesn't touch this knife. There is nothing about that knife that was, that was touched by the maker. You know, something like this, it is. You know, Seth is... Hand grinding them. He's tuning the action, tuning the detent, hand fitting all the oversized parts and making sure everything fits together with the precision and the tolerances that he designed it to be because he designed the knife. And he puts that final edge on and he does the final quality control and inspection. So, you know, this is, this is a different animal. But it's still a great savings if, if whoa, yeah, see, magnets. Fucking magnets, how do they work? <laughs> I've never had it attract another knife before. That was that was unique and different. Um, I don't know what I was saying now. I got completely sidetracked. I apologize. Um, but regardless, so it's in a different tier level. But it's still... Oh, that's what I was going to say. If he were just making you one of these from scratch, cutting all the parts himself, doing everything 100%, it would go from six twenty-five to probably around eight or nine or a thousand dollars, maybe even more. I really don't know. I don't know how much labor, how much time he puts into the, doing all that. So you're still saving money because they are taking that one part by automating the cutting of the parts and reducing the amount of time they have to put into it. And then, man, I tell you right now, I could pick up this knife. Will you stop doing that? All right, you're going up here because you're just too expensive to be getting screwed up. All right. <laughs> did, I just, did I just yell at my knives like a, like a child? Get out of the fucking cookie jar. All right. Then I put this knife in my hands, full production, $400 or under $400. Basic components, just a frame lock, M390 steel. Nothing crazy. But the design is so cool, and the fidget factor is way high. And I get a thorough enjoyment out of an under $400 knife. That's 
ridiculous. I want to hear your thoughts down below. I want to, you know, tell me about some of the knives that you consider your favorites. Some of the knives that have come out and shocked you with how they operate or how they're designed or something about their design. Tell me what you think. Are you excited about this new era of innovation and taking things to different levels? I mean, fucking magnetic knives, really? Who would have seen that coming five years ago? Nobody, I tell you, nobody. Give me your thoughts, put them down below. Thank you guys for joining me as always. I'm out of here and I'll catch you on the next video.